Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And we are so excited to have Isabella Wentz. And we are talking about how to get your adrenals into balance. We're talking about what if you're on thyroid meds and you still don't feel good. We're going to be talking about low cortisol, high cortisol, and her new book, Adrenal Transformation Protocol. So we're so excited. Is Isabella, welcome. Hi, Chantel. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah. So let's let's first start with talking about thyroid. So I know that we have so many listeners on here that are currently on thyroid medicine, and we have tons of people in the chat and in our Facebook group that are like, you know, I'm on thyroid medicine, but I'm still experiencing all of the different symptoms that they say, you know, that if you're taking thyroid medicine, you shouldn't be having those same symptoms. They're cold, they're tired, all of those different things. So sure. So that's a common thing that I go through with a lot of people that I've worked with where they're already on medications and they're like, I am still struggling, right? And I go through like, okay, so what are the ducks we need to get in a row? So first of all, we're looking at like, are you on the right dose of medication and the right type of medication? So generally what I like to see is people will have their TSH somewhere between 0.5 and 2. Um, most ladies that I've worked with feel best when their TSH is right around one. A lot of times people will go and get levothyroxine or other thyroid meds and they will be put on these medications, but like the lab ranges will be off. So they'll have a TSH that's like four. And the doctor will say like, well, that's within normal. But I know personally, when I had a TSH of four, I felt like a sloth. (laughs) I was exhausted with that TSH. And most women will say the same thing. So not everybody's the same, but somewhere between 0.5 and 2. The other kind of thing to consider is you're on thyroid meds, but are you absorbing and utilizing your thyroid meds correctly? So as a pharmacist, I've been trained in medications and there is there are medications known as pro drugs right where you take the medication and it needs to be activated by the body into the more active version of the drug this is levothyroxine it's a pro drug the um, chemical abbreviation or common thing we say for that is t4 it does need to be converted to t3 in the body to work properly some women for a whole host of reasons um Two of them I will talk about next may not be able to properly activate that T4 to T3. And so they're walking around with thyroid hormone and a TSH might be normal for them, but their T3 levels are still too low. Um, I know that you have an amazing um, handout on your website that talks about doing various lab tests. And I'm a proponent of doing free T3 and free T4 as well. And if you can kind of like think about um, a dial pad, right? If your T4 is in that top range of the dial pad, this is what pharmacists do that look at your lab values. You want that T3 to kind of follow along with that. If you see um, your T3 is kind of on this side and your T4 is on that side, there's a chance that you don't have, you're not converting your T4 to T3 properly and you can utilize different types of thyroid medications, usually ones containing T3, like Armour Thyroid um, might be an option. But beyond that, it's like, why are you not converting your T4 to T3 correctly? One reason might be because you don't have enough iron on board. And the test that your doctor may not have done is known as ferritin. So ferritin is our iron storage protein. We want the levels to be at least like 60, maybe even 80 to 100 for optimal thyroid function and for us not to lose hair, right? This is a lab test you can ask your doctor to order for you. You can self-order it. A lot of times um, I will see women that are like, I'm on thyroid meds, but I still feel super tired. New research is showing that part of the reason might be because your ferritin is low. And um, people will say, I have restless sex syndrome. I'm anxious. I have trouble falling asleep. I have trouble throughout the night. I am cold. I am fatigued. This is because we do need iron to help us utilize our thyroid hormones. And so oftentimes I will recommend get your ferritin tested 
And then you can figure out if you need more iron. Now, we don't want to just supplement with iron because um, too much of it can be toxic, right? So you do want to test and not guess for this particular value and um, make sure that you are addressing that if that is low for you, which I do see in many women. And then um, one of my favorite topics to talk about is why we don't feel so good when we're on thyroid meds is because of the adrenals. So if you're supporting your thyroid and you're not supporting your adrenals, this could be a reason why, because our two hormones, right, our, our thyroid hormones and our adrenal hormones, all of those hormones talk to one another and there's a feedback loop between adrenal hormones and thyroid hormones. So, um, so would love to dive deeper into that. I have a really good question from a listener that I'm going to ask you that ties all this together. It's from Cindy Wendella from Arlington, Texas. I love your episodes and I'm binge listening all the time and my favorite are on thyroid. I think I have a goiter or a lump or a swelling on the front of my neck and I googled it and it said it's caused by a swollen thyroid. I'm also taking progesterone, estrogen and testosterone right now. My ferritin is very low on my lab work. I do take a multivitamin and I eat tons of red meat and my ferritin is still low. Why would it be low? Do you think I have parasites? But my doctor said it's not that big of a deal that my ferritin is low, but I'm still very tired. I looked on Google and it said that goiters are not usually serious, but it should be checked. But I am very concerned. Cindy. That's that's a really great question, Cindy. And hello, I'm in Austin, Texas. So just just one of your neighbors here. That um I few things come up for me. So thinking about ferritin. So yes, this is a super, super important thing to address because that could be why you're tired and experiencing many of the symptoms that you're experiencing. Now, parasites could be a reason why your ferritin could be low. Um, there is a test known as the GI map test that I might recommend or a gut zoomer test to test for parasites for individuals. Um, I will say that more commonly, the ferritin might be low because you have H. pylori or SIBO. So parasites, I would say um, maybe up to about 20 to 30 percent of the time, this can be relevant for people with Hashimoto's. SIBO is about 50 percent of the time. This is going to be relevant. So you need a, a breath test for that. And then with the H. pylori, I mean, anywhere from more than 60% of people with Hashimoto's could have H. pylori, and that could be a cause of your low ferritin, could be a cause of your fatigue. If you have acid reflux, you can have this. And also, it can actually cause Graves' disease and Hashimoto's antibodies. So I would definitely consider doing a gut test. if um, that's, that's what I would typically do for people who are presenting with a variety of symptoms. The other thing is it sounds like you're already on hormones, but oftentimes women with very heavy menses or women after childbirth, they're going to end up with having low levels of iron and ferritin. And so um, part of that is making sure your estrogen and progesterone is um, balanced. So when we don't have enough progesterone, we might start getting really heavy periods. Sounds like you're kind of on top of that with your doctor. So hopefully that's not the case for you. Another reason is m women might have really heavy periods and lose a lot of blood when they have methylation issues. Taking something like methylfolate in the right doses can be helpful if you have like huge blood clots, right? If you're seeing that's part of your um, period presentation, this would be something that I would consider that can be a significant source of blood loss for way too many people, way underappreciated. I see it very commonly in my clients. And then... Um, Really thinking about that is if you have gut issues and that's what's causing your ferritin to be low, the, the red meat that you're eating, there's a chance that you're not absorbing the iron from it. So some of the things I might recommend is doing digestive enzymes or digestive bitters to help you support that digestion taking some of the meat with um, something like vitamin C, which can help support our stomach acid production. And then the other thing is what many women have found that they actually need iron infusions when they have a condition like Hashimoto's because 
that and they're constantly losing iron because of gut issues or menstrual issues because that can get their iron levels up much quicker and much more reliably. There's also research that shows um, iron infusions tend to bypass the gut. So we're going to be absorbing the iron better and we're not going to be feeding the, um, the, the various pathogens that we might have in our gut. They make biofilms and iron actually feeds the biofilms. So um, I know that that's kind of a lot to cover. And I would definitely would encourage you to work with a functional doctor to help you unravel all of this. Of course, this is not like medical advice because I don't know you personally, but hopefully that sends you on the right path. And then as far as goiters and shrinking goiters, um, I would want to look at doing maybe like a nutrient panel for you <clears throat> and considering doing some detoxification support. Um, some women have found utilizing something like castor oil over their gland, thyroid glands may be helpful. And again, H. pylori can be a potential cause of that. So um, a lot of information here. Hopefully that is helpful on your journey. Yeah. And I do want you to explain a little bit the difference between what ferritin is and what the difference between iron deficiency is. Because both of those are lab tests. And I think, you know, they say people, I've heard two different people. I've seen some doctors say that ferritin is the best indicator of an iron deficiency. And then some people say it's not the best indicator of an iron deficiency. So I want you to explain what the difference between ferritin and iron, your iron levels are, and what is a better indicator of whether your iron is low or not. Sure. So you can you would look at like red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and these are sort of the anemia panels that a person, a physician might order. Now, those will be low in like very overt iron deficiency. But if you're looking at some of that functional iron deficiency and kind of the early stages of it where you're perhaps not transporting thyroid hormone into your cells correctly, we want to look at ferritin. So I will, I just to be clear, I would definitely do the whole panel of the red blood cells and the whole iron panel. But the one that doctors often don't add is the ferritin one. And that's one that's commonly missed. And that's kind of like that early indicator that it, there's something off about your iron storage. And then your body is kind of not really able to, um, it, it's, it's essentially going to be pulling your iron from other non-essential functions like getting a thyroid hormone into cells or growing beautiful hair or giving you lots of energy. Yeah, I think I think what you said about the importance of eating foods rich in vitamin C or taking vitamin C um, is really important. And whether you're, because what I think the key that you just said is, are you absorbing the iron that you're taking? Because if you do have a lot of gut issues, you could be eating it and just not absorbing it. So that could be an, another issue. Absolutely. That is a very common thing that I see in people with thyroid issues, for sure, where they're not absorbing the iron that they're eating in from these beautiful foods, right? Yes. Let's just take a minute and let's talk about my latest discovery. Listen, this is the hottest super nutrient-packed product that's going to boost your brain and your overall well-being. First of all, as soon as I tried this product, I became a fan of it and was blown away by the immediate result. I felt focused, my mind was clear, it just doubled my mental performance. So this product has the superpowers of mushroom extracts and collagen. So it has four of the best health boosting mushrooms. It's got lion's mane, chaga, cordyceps, and reishi collagen and Peruvian cacao. So when you combine all of these, the four mushrooms and the collagen, it is going to energize your brain and your body. It's called Kala Genius. So check it out, newtopia.com slash wasteawaygenius and use the code wasteaway10 during checkout. Um, so let's talk about cortisol for just a second. And I want you to talk about how you can decide 
some of the symptoms, like do I have low cortisol? Do I have high cortisol? And how that ties into your adrenals. Sure. So people oftentimes hear like cortisol is bad, cholesterol is bad, like all of these things are like labeled good or bad, where cortisol is neither good or bad. It, it actually, I would say it's more good than bad. It's, act, it's essential. So we need cortisol to survive. It helps us with energy production. It helps us with our immunity. It helps us manage the inflammation in our bodies. And a healthy person will have a little bit of cortisol secretion early in the morning to help ourselves wake up. And then we get this nice little curve. It looks like a slide where you go down. And then at the very end of the day, you'll have just a little bit of cortisol. And then your body knows that it's time to rest, um, get relaxed, and go to sleep and have refreshing sleep. Now, what I see a lot of times in people, and I would say 90% of the people that I've worked with, with Hashimoto's and thyroid issues um, and hypothyroidism, they'll have some degree and some deviation from that healthy cortisol pattern where they'll have too much cortisol in the day. And a lot of times, this is what you'll hear on the headline news is like, we have too much cortisol. Um, too much cortisol can make us sore belly fat. Or, um, you know, these are kind of the headlines out there that cortisol is our stress hormone. And yes, this is true. And it can be problematic when we have too much of it. Um, but there's other types of pattern of cortisol abnormalities that I see. Um, one of them is a cortisol roller coaster where a person might have the overall levels of daily cortisol that are great. They're within that healthy range. But rather than having this like gradual slide, they might start off low and then they jump and then, then it's low and then they jump again. And then they're like tired in the morning. Then they get this rush of energy in the afternoon. Then they have a 3 p.m. crash. And then in the evening, they're wired and tired and they can't sleep. So um, this is another pattern that I see. Then the other pattern is a flipped cortisol curve where, where somebody will wake up tired and then they're tired kind of throughout the day in the evenings. They have energy. They're like the, the um, night owls, right? And then the last kind Ooh. of pattern that, that I see is the flatlined cortisol where people just wake up tired. They're brain fogged. They're super sluggish throughout the whole day. And then they go to bed tired. And it's like, then they wake up unrefreshed. And so this is kind of, I guess the two extremes would be that flatlined cortisol curve where the person is super tired, super sluggish. And then we have at the other extreme, the high cortisol um, person who is irritable. They're fast. Everybody around them is super annoying and um, they're anxious. They can't sleep at night. They're just super, super wired, but tired. Um, and some of the, the key kind of symptom wise, the symptoms can overlap a little bit here and there and people might not be um, as, as tuned into like, okay, is this a symptom of this? Is this a symptom of that? And we might have some of that mixed, but there are physical tests we can do. So a person with low cortisol will usually have low blood pressure and a person with high cortisol will usually have high blood pressure. That's kind of one of the, the big connections there. Um, where you'll know like, okay, this is, this is a sign. I know a lot of times doctors will say like, oh, they'll see a person with chronic fatigue syndrome with hypothyroidism and they'll say like, your blood pressure looks so good, right? Because um, it'll be like 90 over 60 and it's like, no, actually, you want your blood pressure to be a little bit higher than that. You want to have um, healthy levels of blood going through your veins to give you life and vitality. Um, so this is one thing that people can do at home by themselves is figure out what their blood pressure is, and that's going to help them determine their cortisol levels. With regard to testing, I, I love functional medicine testing, and you can utilize the cortisol test. You can do the ZRT adrenal saliva test or a Dutch test, and those can be very helpful for figuring out at what, de what degree of, a, of kind of cortisol dysfunction you might have. So one of the things you talk about in the book is that when you when you have adrenal dysfunction, that maybe the body has an inability to produce some of those essential hormones when it mismanages stress. So talk about that. 
Of course. So whenever the body can't produce a healthy stress response, we just feel super, super overwhelmed. That's actually can be a big um, symptom for just any kind of adrenal dysfunction. But when we have that overwhelm with the fatigue and the low blood pressure, trouble waking up in the morning, there's a chance that we're not adapting to stressors, even healthy stressors. So these are the women that I talk to that are like, hey, I'm exercising, but I feel worse after exercise. Or I tried fasting, but I feel worse. And all of these, you know, wonderful things that build resilience in our bodies, they're just making them feel worse. So they want to be more active, right? You like, you want to do exercise because it's good for you. And we know that um, fasting can promote autophagy and helping us like clear ourselves, right? But then they, they do it and they're like, but I feel awful with like trying to do some of these helpful, healthy things, right? And so part of that could be that low cortisol. So your body just doesn't know how to respond to that stress and you just feel awful all the time. And the key for for many women like that, and this is so counterintuitive, is they'll say, I'm lowering my caloric intake and I am exercising a ton, right? And we'll say, actually, because of where you are on your healing journey, you need to start off with like not exercising so much and not restricting calories, right? So we need to just kind of do some replenishment and get your healthy cortisol curve established, right? So we actually want to help you increase your cortisol. And we do that through a lot of kind of um, focusing on resting and a lot of um, pleasurable activities. Now, the beauty of it is like a lot of the things I share in my book, there are specific recommendations for high cortisol and low cortisol. But majority of it is like, de-stressing because that'll help the person with low cortisol and the person with high cortisol, right? And everybody in between. Yeah. So talk about um, DHEA and how you're using that to balance the adrenals. DHEA can be incredibly helpful um, for balancing the adrenals. So it's known as our youth hormone, right? Um, whenever I was trained in functional medicine and some of the protocols to balance the adrenals, I would utilize pregnenolone and DHEA throughout the day based on a person's cortisol curve to reestablish that healthy cortisol pattern. This can work really well if you're working with a practitioner that like knows what they're doing. But the tricky part is some women will take DHEA and rather than giving them like that useful glow, it'll give them chin hair and back knee. Um, so that is can be very tricky. But what I've found is Epsom salt baths can raise our DHEA levels naturally and they bypass that hormonal system. So you don't get that acne. You don't get those um, um, gorgeous chin hairs, right? You actually just support your DHEA levels by topical magnesium absorption. And this is actually one of the things that's part of my protocol, my adrenal protocol for most people, if you can get some magnesium into your body. Best way to do it is through um, topical means. So you can do something like a Epsom salt bath or perhaps like a magnesium based lotion or spray. One of the things I want you to talk about is what is the day in the life of Dr. Isabella Wentz look like? And I want you to be as specific as possible, kind of talking about like in the morning, like, do you take thyroid medicine yourself? And like, how much do you take and what kind do you take and what supplements you take, kind of what food you eat, what food you don't eat? Um, what is your workout routine look like? Like, just walk us through kind of some of those things that you do that we could learn from that keep you feeling your very best. Sure. And I will say my day looks a lot different now than it did 10 years ago when I was trying to take back my health or even before I was a mom. Right. So basically, my day starts with um, my son waking me up (laughs) and saying, look me, it's make up time. Right. And throughout there, I will go into the bathroom and um, take my thyroid medications. I am taking armor now. I think it's a really, really helpful medication because it does contain T4 and T3 so that my body doesn't have to do the conversion. I like the conversions already done for me. 
So in case my iron levels drop or something else is going on, then I can actually have a little bit of that extra T3 supporting me. Then once I kind of um, take that, I will step outside if I can to just get some morning sunshine into my eyes to help me wake up naturally throughout the day. Um, I will then make some tea and breakfast for my son, do some snuggles on the couch, feed my son his breakfast, and then I will drop him off at school. When I get home is when I'll make myself something to eat, usually like a smoothie. Um, I love utilizing hydrolyzed beef protein to um, support my body. I will, um, if, if I have had a tough day beforehand, I will usually have an adrenal kickstart. And that is um, orange juice with a little bit of um, hydrolyzed beef protein, some extra electrolytes, some sea salt and a bit of coconut milk just to support my stress response. Um, after becoming a mom, my sleep hasn't been um, exemplary. So oftentimes I might like get woken up in the middle of the night because somebody has to go potty or because somebody had a bad dream. So I will always do that in case if I didn't sleep very well the night before. Um, if, if I did, if I slept well and I know that my cortisol doesn't need a lot of support that morning, I will just have breakfast a little bit later where I would have something like a smoothie. And then I go through um, what I put in my smoothie. There's I have a root cause green smoothie where I'll put lettuce and blueberries and some coconut milk and some protein, some um, carrots and kind of kind of lowish carb, but lots of greens. Then as I go and on about my day, I might um, usually um, spend some time with my husband and I'll maybe do a little bit of work. Um, unless I'm in book launch mode, then I do a lot of work. Um, and then as I go to my noon time is when I'll have a bit of a lunch. So usually I'll have something like either like a salad or a stir fry for lunch where I'll have a bunch of veggies with some meat. This might be a time that I would have um, my supplements. I usually focus a lot on adrenal support. So something like ashwagandha. I focus on B vitamins, vitamin um, C. And then I focus, I take benzotiamine, which um, 600 milligrams a day has been found to support um, like relieve thyroid fatigue in just three days in some cases. So I do take benfotiamine on a daily basis. This is something that I found to be very, very helpful. Um, I also take carnitine, which is helpful for brain function, for, um, for adrenal health, for our mitochondria, and, for, and has also been shown helpful to um, support thyroid fatigue in women with thyroid issues. I go through... Um, Usually I might have something like mud water after lunch. If I have caffeine anywhere after I turned 40. So if I have caffeine after 3 p.m., I won't sleep. If I have caffeine before 3 p.m., I will sleep just fine. So I, I do know that I have to have it like somewhere around lunchtime. Otherwise, if I don't have it, then I won't have caffeine for the rest of the day. And then um, maybe the afternoon I might do have some time outside with my husband drinking um, mud water or just talking about our day, going back to work after that, um, and then picking up our son from, from preschool, and then we would take a family walk or hike. Um, usually we'll have dinner, and then what we do in our house is we change all of our lights after sunset to red. So everybody like knows us, knows us as like the red house on our block. Um, but basically, this kind of sets us up for a great circadian rhythm where we can get really good rest in the evenings. Um, when, once we've had dinner, I will go take an Epsom salt bath um, anywhere from like um, 30 minutes if it's been an easy day to an hour and a half if it's been a hard day. I find the Epsom salts just really, really relax me. So if, you know, if you're anxious, if you've had a tough day if you're cramping, if you had a tough workout, um, it does work as a natural muscle relax and it does su support healthy DHEA levels, right? And then after that, we will, I'll get my son ready for bed, get my, and start reading him some books. 
And um, usually he'll go, he'll fall asleep before me. And if it's depending on, um, depending on the day, I will either go to sleep shortly thereafter or maybe stay up and hang out with my husband for a little bit. I mm, love that. Well, I'm going to ask another question, and this one's really long, so I'm just going to cut pieces out of it because it's just too long of a question to read. And what she basically says is, should I take a natural desiccated thyroid-like armor? I used to take armor, and now I'm taking a compounded thyroid from a compounded pharmacy, and it's just so expensive. Like She's having trouble affording it. And she's not sure that she felt any better than she did when she was on the armor. And what is the benefits of using a compounded thyroid from a compounded pharmacy versus an armor? And then she says a friend told her about the most absorbable form of a thyroid hormone, which is a liquid form. And she'd never heard of that and wanted to to get some insight on what is this liquid thyroid hormone and it's kind of in a liquid gel capsule. Um, And if you've heard of that and what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. So, um, so in just full disclosure for it's called Tyrosint and it is, uh, comes in a gel cap and they've done a ton of research on how absorbable this medication is. So even if you have H. pylori, if, even if you have atropic gastritis, even if you have low stomach acid, which a lot of people do with hypothyroidism, you're still going to be able to take that medication. And, and even if you like um, thyroid medications are like notoriously um, interactive. So you, you have to take them on an empty stomach with a full glass of water. You can't have your coffee within an hour, sometimes up to four hours. But with tyrosine, you can like take your thyroid meds and chug your coffee, right? And so when I was a brand new mom, um, I was like, I need to switch to this medication, right? Uh, because it was great. You, can, you don't have to worry about anything else as far as absorption goes. In full disclosure, I, I did have a grant from them. So I have been, um, um, I guess, a, a speaker for them. So I do have affiliation with that company. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful product for people that have a lot of food sensitivities and trouble absorbing that medication. It is a T4 only medication. So people Mm -hmm. do need to make sure if you're going to be utilizing this medication, which I've seen works phenomenally for a lot of people, is you do actually need to check your ferrets and make sure that's addressed. And you also do need to make sure that you are balancing your adrenals because when we have... um, our cortisol's out of balance, like with our adrenals, we might actually produce more of something called reverse T3. Um, and same when we have low ferritin, where that gets into our um, thyroid hormone receptors and it binds them, but it doesn't activate them. So then we can't um, activate our thyroid hormones. And we know that T3 is the more active hormone. So you do want to make sure that you take care of the conversion issues if you have any, if you're on that medication. But I have found that it works so well for so many people that you would say you would take that but you would add a t3 into it so not you, always no so I, if you can if you don't yeah. need it right yeah i would say just make sure that you're converting it correctly um so i know um a lot of people myself personally people that i've worked with we would look at their their values and we they would be on tyrosine and they would co- convert it just fine right But oftentimes I know the people that I work with, their adrenals are balanced and their ferritin levels are balanced, right? So those are the kind of key components of of being healthy um, and having like, you know, you don't just do your thyroid when you're hypothyroid. You also manage like the consequences of being hypothyroid for so long, like low stomach acid. And you also look at the root causes, right? That's a comprehensive approach. With medications that contain T3, I think they can be incredibly helpful if you're not doing that conversion from T4 to T3. Some people just genetically can't do it. And so in that situation, you would always want to take a T3. For other people, like you can convert on your own. Um, It's easier just for many people, like when they don't want to do kind of the deep healing work to just take an armor medication like that or a compounded medication that already contains T4 and T3 or add like a Cytomel to a T4 medication. 
if that makes sense, right? But I feel like for for people that I um, counsel and I, people that I work with and people I educate is like, you know, you might be on armor and that's fabulous, but please don't forget these other things, right? Because these other things don't just impact our thyroid hormone production, but they can also be a sign of something that's out of balance in your body, like the ferritin and an H. pylori or a SIBO, um, so on and so forth. But going back to the, should you take desiccated thyroid or should you take compounded oh, thyroid, right? So the some of the natural desiccated thyroid, like armor, they might have some fillers that people may react to. And some people might react to the small amounts of thyroglobulin that are within them. If you're one of those people, then you would want to consider like a tyrosine or you might want to consider um, a compounded thyroid med, right? If you're doing really well with armor and it works for you and it's, you know, a good price for you, then there's no reason why not to take it, right? Um, with the compounded meds, a lot of people do find they like them because they can tailor the dosages. So you don't necessarily need to have like a standard T4 to T3. The compounding pharmacist can work with your prescriber and say like, okay, we're going to give this person just a little bit more T3 or we're going to boost up the T4 just to get their labs and symptoms really adjusted. So that's the beauty of it. Um, pharmacists can make them in a hypoallergenic fashion, which is really, really fabulous for a lot of people. Um, but the, some of the drawbacks is they can be expensive. Not every... Um, Pharmacists might have the skills or resources to make them, so it might be challenging to find them. Some of them also may not use um, the right kind of starter products, so the the levels can be out of balance. So you might not get like super accurate dosing. And then some people might have issues with absorbing some of the fillers used in pharmaceutical compounding, such as methasol or avasol. Some people with SIBO or digestive issues, gastritis, they um, just may not get that same absorption that they would with armor or even with tyrosine. But I know, thank you for asking that question. Nobody ever asks me these questions. So I, I'm sorry if that was too much information, but I am a pharmacist. No, I, I, I love that question because I feel the same way. I'm so glad she asked it. Um, I actually take a compounded, um, compounded, thyroid medicine as well. And I pick, I usually have my assistant pick it up. And so I don't even like really look at how much it costs. And this last time I went and picked it up and I was like, what? That's how much, you know, I just don't really look sometimes. So I was like, I cannot believe I'm paying that much. And I, that question really stood out to me because I was thinking I'm paying way too much for this compounded pharma pharmaceutical. And I don't feel that I used to take armor. So I'm thinking the same thing. Like, because the truth is, if you need more T3, you could ask your doctor to do armor, which is so cheap, by the way. Um, now, now that we even had this conversation, I'm like going to be completely <laughs> off this compound of pharmacy. I'm going to message my doctor immediately and say, give me armor and then give me some extra T3 because I do, I need extra T3. That's not quite enough for me for the armor thyroid, but I can just take a little bit of extra T3. But I think the one thing is now that I'm thinking about it, I think mine has a something where it makes it spread out longer. I'm trying, I'm yep. losing the word of what, what's it called when it kind of goes all the way through where it doesn't give it to you so fast. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So so there's like suspended release or delayed release technology based on like what kind of filler the pharmacist might use. Mm -hmm. Where you have immediate release compounded thyroid meds and then then there's the suspended release. Slow so the release, slow release. Kind of like you don't just get um a quick hit in the morning of thyroid hormone. It's supposed to mimic more of how your body would release it. Um some practitioners will also like give you thyroid hormone in the morning and then they might give you another smaller dose in the afternoon. There's there's a lot of really cool dosing protocols and I I definitely recommend everybody work with with like a super knowledgeable practitioner because there's if you're not optimized on meds, that's one of the the places to start with thyroid issues. Um and there's more than one medication out there, right? Yes. Well, this has been amazing. Tell listeners about your new book and tell them where they can find you and where they can follow you. 
Sure. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for these great questions. It was so much fun to kind of dive into the details. Um, Adrenal Transformation Protocol is my new book. And this is a four-week plan to release stress symptoms and go from surviving to thriving. Um, this is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever fine books are sold. The official release date is April 18th. And so if people pre-ordered now, they'll be able to get that book um, sent to them soon. I'm so excited to share. We have had um, 3,500 people go through this program um, before I turned it into a book, and 92% of them have less brain fog. And then things like fatigue, blood sugar issues, um, like irritability, anxiety, libido issues, pain, 80 to 90% of people feel better within three, three to four weeks with these symptoms. And I know that is a game changer for people that have been sick for, for years, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, this has been awesome. You guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now.